Well, let's turn to Gaza. We are very happy to be joined again here on Breakthrough News by Dr. Medhat Abbas, who's from the International Department of Gaza's Health Ministry. Dr. Abbas, thank you so much for being back with us here on Breakthrough News. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, and have a nice day. No, the pleasure is all ours. Um, if you could just give our viewers a sense, what is the situation there uh, on the ground in Gaza? Oh, there is no situation. I mean, we are dying. We are dying everywhere. I mean, death is around us everywhere. We are attacking domestic zones. You know, as you know, Gaza Strip is a very tiny strip of land. It's only th 360 kilometers square inhabited by 2 million population. The length of Gaza Strip is 45 kilometers only, and the width of that is ranging between 5 kilometers and 11 kilometers. Imagine in this very tiny strip of land, which is the highly dense population all over the world. It's much more than Mumbai and Cairo, by the way. Imagine in this area, we are being attacked from the Navy and by heavy artillery bombardment and drones and F-35 and cannons and tanks at the same time. Imagine all those machines and quadricap, this is small plane that get inside the windows and assassinate people inside their beds. All those technologies are being used, especially the F-35, which was manufactured by USA to defend army against another army, but not against children in their bed. Imagine now, we used to hear the sound of war plane before, and then we hear the explosion. Today, we don't hear because the F-35 is very advanced, you know. They attack us from afar, so we don't see them. We don't hear them mm -hmm. at all. We just hear explosions. And because it has the ability to attack many targets at the same time, many children at the same time, so you hear dozens of explosions at once. Everywhere around you, you don't know why, you don't know how. What's the sin of those people to be killed? They are just children. Like what you're writing in your screen, 227 killed, out of them are 64 children. And they have nothing to do. Two days ago, they killed one of my colleagues. He was an internal medicine specialist. They killed him with his wife and with all children, except one, he's still in intensive care. He's 16 years old, and nobody told him that he lost all his family, of course. He is now, he, he wake up, but they told him, oh, you will be okay, and no, nobody's mentioning anything about his family. Because if the child know that he lost all his family, he will certainly die in the ICU. He had a sister. He, he, she passed away in this attack. She was in the third year in the faculty of dentistry, and she was about to marry in one month. The last thing she said after attacking their building, which was four stories, she sent a message to her friend. She said, I'm still alive under the rubble. Please come to clear me quickly. And then, but when they reached her, she was dead. Uh, another another colleague, also a psychiatrist of 66 years old, they killed him also with all his family. They attack a whole building without any pre-warning so that the people die inside. Sometimes they, they give you a pre-warning and sometimes not. So you don't know at what time you may die. Your children are scared. You cannot sleep during midnight. Imagine that you wake up on a very big sound of explosion with tachycardia, your heart starts to beat quickly and your children are screaming and they are scared and everybody's hugging you. They think that when they hug their father, that will be their protection. In fact, the father has nothing to do for them. And, and they are attacking health facilities. You know, two hospitals in the north, one is called Beit Hanun Hospital and the Indonesia Hospital were attacked partially. And they have totally annihilated uh, another primary health care clinics, two of them. And one main center, the headquarter of MOH was also attacked and the central laboratory was also attacked in which we were doing corona investigations and giving corona vaccinations to people. Um, I, I don't know what, what's, what's the, the problem with, between the Israelis, the Israeli army, and the health facilities. What's the problem between the Israelis and our doctors? What's the problem between them and the children? Believe me, I'm trying to think a hundred times every day why they are killing those people. I mean, that pilot who is attacking our children under which law, under which condition? How can he sleep during night? Believe me, I couldn't understand. Believe me, if you bring me any Israeli child now and tell me punish this child, I will never do it. I can't. I can't punish a child. I can't punish a woman. I can't punish an elderly man. They killed 16 elderly men. Why? For God's sake, why? These are innocent civilians. They are staying in their homes. They are not representing any risk to anybody. 
They were just staying home in peace. I remember a, a woman saying, I was taking my lunch with my, uh, my, my husband, with my children, and he died. He lost his head. And she was just crying and screaming in the hospital, in the emergency room. So tell me, for God's sake, well, this is the situation on the ground. If you want some numbers, our hospitals are having only 2,200 beds. In those beds, the, the ideal number, which is supposed to be, is 4,000. So we have almost 50%. Mm -hmm. We are poor. We have no, I mean, we are living under siege for 15 years. So if the same rates of casualties start, continue to reach the hospital with the same rate, I assure you that the health system in this country will collapse soon. And everybody mm -hmm. here about Gaza siege, Gaza siege, what meaning of siege? Let me tell you the meaning of siege. The siege is not only that we are not able to travel. No, the siege means that a student would not pay the tuition fees for his university. The siege means prevailing poverty for more, more, more than 80% of the population and 68% anemia for our children and 70% anemia for our pregnant women. And it means uh, 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 prevailing poverty everywhere where you go. The people cannot afford to find food, so they rely, 80% of the Palestinian families rely on free food tickets from humanitarian organizations. And you cannot make it outside. And if you can travel outside, it will be very difficult to return back. It may take months, by the way. And the other thing is that imagine a patient who is having cancer and he needs radiotherapy. Radiotherapy is not available in Gaza Strip, so that he has to take a permission from the Israelis. And the Israelis mm. are not giving this permission except for one third of those who are applying. So the rest has to face their destiny. They will succumb to their destiny and die in peace in Gaza. They die because of complications, treatable complications inside Gaza, because they couldn't make it outside. So this is the meaning of siege. The siege means that we have shortage of medication inside our hospitals. Almost more than 50% of medications and medical supply are absent from our stores. So we were living in a siege. We have been living in that siege for 15 years. And then Corona came for one and a half a year. And now this aggression now for, the, for 10 days. Imagine now what could be the situation on the ground. The people now left their homes, almost 50,000 people, and they are now finding a shelter in the honor schools. What about social distancing? How many times have you heard the word social distancing to avoid Corona? A hundred times every day you hear it. And when you send those people to the shelter in thousands, how could they have social distancing? I assure you that Corona will spread very rapidly in those days because of the overcrowded people. They have attacked the roads leading to the main hospital of Gaza Strip. Al-Wahda Street is the, the main road leading to the central hospital of Gaza. It is totally broken, this street now. It's destroyed. So the ambulance has to find indirect ways to waste more time of a bleeding patient. And these are the golden seconds in which you try to do, you do your best to save the lives of those people. Can you see those scenes on your screen? The first, first of all, sometimes they send a pre-warning rocket, a small one, and then the F-35 will come and attack it, and then it will be annihilated at once. You see too much mm. smokes, and every building around it will be shaking like an earthquake, and everybody's scared, and people run away. And that's our life in Gaza, sir. We're speaking to Dr. Medhat Abbas. He's uh, from the Gaza Health Ministry. Dr. Abbas, can you give us idea, an idea of the kinds of injuries that you guys are having to treat? I mean, given the limited uh, medical supplies Gaza was already suffering from given the siege, uh, how is it dealing with what I'm sure are really horrific and difficult to operate on injuries for those who survived these bombings? The, the people are disfigured, you know. I don't want you, I'm quite sure that the manufacturer of the F-35 has never ever thought one day that it might be used against children. It will disfigure everything, you know. You don't find a human being, somebody who's amputated, somebody who's torn apart. I mean, it's just miserable explosions are happening. That's why the intensive care units are full of disfigured people. They're just breathing and, and for sure they will die. And, um, and you, they are untreatable. You just, they are just breathing and you keep, you try to put some monitors and, and stabilize their blood, but, but they will never be able to make it. On the other, the other thing is that how we can cope with this shortage of supplies, I tell you, the emergency th needs are available in our emergency rooms and the operation rooms, but we are using them, we are trying to rationalize the use of those things as much as we can. Because if we, 
you know, use them properly and normally, we will run out of them very soon. So we have tried to rationalize the use step by step, and we try to appeal for every international organization to extend a helping hand to us so that we can sustain our service. Now, Egyptians have opened the border to receive some of our patients, and I, hear, I read in the news that they are now going to build a, a field hospital adjacent to the border of Gaza and Palestine so that they can take our patients. And I hear that Jordan also is planning to send a field hospital to help us. But if the Israelis continue attacking us with the same rate, I think no hospital will be able to cope with the mounting numbers of casualties at all. At all. Yeah. And well, one thing I want to ask as well, Dr. Abbas, that I, you know, with the New York Times is reporting this this morning, uh, the lack of water, the lack of food uh, inside of Gaza currently. Uh, can you talk about the impact of, of that as well on people, which I'm sure is, is very intense? Well, we have no potable water in Gaza. Most of the time we ha you have to buy it, but you don't have it reaching your home like any other country in the world. We don't have that. You have to buy it and it's, it, it, it will cost you money. And because of the prevailing poverty in Gaza, not everyone can buy it. And this is explaining why we have high rates of renal failure in Gaza, because the water that they drink is not suitable for human beings. About food, when I told you that 68% of our children are anemic, they are having what's so-called iron deficiency anemia. They do not swallow meat. They do not taste hamburger. They don't know those things. So I, I, I remember once upon a time, I went to a school and I hear that the students are fainting during morning time. Mm -hmm. They stand in lines before getting to the class. And I asked the headmaster, what's wrong with those children? With those girls, they were girls. She said, some of them are very poor. They do not take any food. They, just, they are just starving. I, I did not believe it. I said, could you please show me some of them? And she asked three or four girls to come to me. I was shocked. They were, you know, underweight, pale, and the poverty was seen on their faces. So I went to a friend of mine and I said, hey, he was a businessman. I said, for God's sake, I need to bring them. Don't tell me that they need iron tablets. No, they need food. They need good food to eat. So that friend, he, thank goodness, he gave them one sandwich of meat every day for one month to, a whole, to the whole school. But that is only one school. You have hundreds of school. I was not able to go to other because we have no money to do that. So this is the summary of the situation. Again, the same percent, almost 70 percent of the every pregnant mother in Gaza is anemic also. We are living under siege for 15 years, which has never, ever stopped till this moment. And the corona is there. And now we have this aggression, all of them at once. And electricity is another big problem. The Israelis used to give us 140 megawatt because of the attacks of the infrastructure. They have reduced them to only 20 megawatts. So now we are relying on generators to operate our hospitals, which are needing consuming a lot of fuel. Just today morning, they allowed fuel to get inside to the hospitals, but they control everything what gets inside. They control everything who's getting outside, who's getting inside, what you eat, what you drink, where you go, who are your relatives, everything they know about us. And they're just putting us under microscope and they are selecting which one to die at any point they want. Hmm. Doctor, you know, Abbas, doctor, I'm curious. Oh, no, go ahead, Ronnie. So, well, given that some of your colleagues have apparently been targeted, as you were talking about before, along with their families in the Sunday, essentially, massacre uh, in the road that leads to the hospital, um, has that road been repaired? Are people having difficulty accessing El Shifa Hospital since those bombings? The people can still access the road the way through collateral roads because there are many roads around the hospital, but it's time consuming, but they will certainly reach the hospital. The, the, the main problem is this occupation. If those people mm -hmm. quit and let us live free, believe me, we love peace. We want to live in peace. We don't want to have any other, any, any, any human being in the world. You know, I, by, by the way, when, when Joe Biden became the president, I felt very happy because I saw him visiting the hospital during his election campaigns, and he was reassuring all the workers, the doctors and nurses. I felt very happy. I said, oh, my God, because he lost one son one day. I'm quite sure that he will feel with the pain that we have in Palestine, and he will certainly bring justice to us. And I was, I was waiting that. And when he won, I celebrated that with my children. I said, hey, now we will have justice. America has a very good president today, and he was sure, for sure, he will, he will not let us live under this pain. And then 
when I saw the F-35 attacking us for the first time in his, during his presidential time, I felt very depressed. I was very depressed, believe me. And then they said he will call Benjamin Netanyahu in one hour. I said, oh my God, he responded to our appeals for sure. He will tell Benjamin Netanyahu, stop killing the Palestinian children now. And after that, I discovered that he told him he will give him some weapons for almost $800 million. Believe me, I was shocked. Are you afraid, Dr. Abbas? Do you feel afraid in Gaza right now? I lost feelings. I'm a veteran. It doesn't make too much difference. Now. It doesn't make too much difference. Because you see, everybody around you may die. So, you know, when they keep attacking you, attacking you every along the hour, or your life like that, you become like, I don't know, you, you lose sensations. You, your heart becomes dead. You, you feel that you're, you're frustrated to a degree that it doesn't make too much difference. You're desperate. It doesn't make too much difference. I saw my children crying. I tried to support them, but I don't have that feeling of pain that I used to feel before. Now it makes no difference. I don't know what happened to me. Maybe I need to go to a psychiatrist. I don't know, but I'm quite sure that all of us now have psychiatric problems because of those explosions, you know, it's very hard, it's very hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I live near the seaside, you know, imagine that. The Navy, when they attack you, you listen to the voice twice. Once when they launch it and once when, they, when it reaches us. So you hear two explosions for every attack. So they are doubled. And the cannons from the other side with the artillery bombardment and the drones are in our sky for 24 hours. Do you know the sound of those drones when they are in hundreds? They are like motorbikes, but they are flying in the sky. Mm. They are very noisy. And the F-16 sometimes come to visit us, but the F-35 attacks us from a way that we don't, we, we have never seen it, by the way. We only read about it because you, you listen to the explosions and you don't see any more pain. This is what, this is what's happening in Gaza now. Mm. Well, doctor, I want to also, I mean, you know, we, we don't know when this is going to end, but it seems that the impact of everything that has taken place so far, this brutal bombardment, artillery fire, naval fire, uh, will mean that every problem that exists in Gaza will be magnified now significantly because of the massive damage that's been done. Yeah, Baza is returning back to the Stony Age soon. If they continue like this, there will be no gas. There will be only some rebels with some, with some killed people, with some cadavers and cemeteries. I don't know. They are attacking us heavily. And I don't know. I don't know how could that continue. I don't know. Do you know, let me tell you the story that everybody of us knows it in Gaza. Benjamin Netanyahu will certainly go to prison because of corruption charges. And the only way for him to escape that crime is to kill more children in Palestine so that he can succeed and make a new coalition in his government. And then he may change the law so that nobody can arrest the prime minister of Israel. This is the only thing. Now. This is my belief because I could not understand. I would ask him now, please, for God's sake, make an interview with Israeli spokesman and tell him why you killed Dr. Ayman Abu Awf and his children. I want to have an answer to this question. I want to have, because, you know, I know that doctor. I met, the last time I met Dr. Ayman was two months ago when my brother had corona. Dr. Ayman is the one leading the battle against corona in Gaza. And I went with my brother to the hospital. It was the end of his duty and he was going back home. When he saw me, he said, hi, Dr. Mithat. And he returned it back to me to help. He used to help everybody. And he returned it back to me and said, how can I help you, Dr. Mithat? I said, my brother is febrile and I think he's having corona right now. He said, okay, just don't worry. He made all investigations for him. He reassured me and my brother. He said, you will be okay. Do you need any help, Dr. Methat? I said, no, thank you so much. He went back home. He was teaching our students in faculties of medicine. And he was teaching doctors to become specialists in Gaza. But why they killed him? He was 50 years old. He was born in Germany. He studied medicine in Slovakia. And he did his postgraduate of medicine in Jordan. He was highly educated. Why they killed him? That loss cannot be substituted, you know? Even when ceasefire will not bring him back to us, to our hospital and to our patients, it will never return him back again. Why they killed him? Believe me, I don't know. Why they attack health facilities? I, I, I need an answer for that. It's not justified, you know. It's not, I couldn't understand. I couldn't understand how a pilot could attack those targets. These are not 
targets. These are civilians. Do you kill children? I'm quite sure that the one who made F-35 has no. It was made to defend America from another army, but not against children of Gaza. Would that manufacturer do it? Would he make another weapon to kill more children? No. Believe me, Caterpillar, when they were just demolishing houses by Caterpillar, somebody wrote a letter to Caterpillar company in USA and said, are you making those to demolish houses of civilians? It was a very big problem. They told the Israelis, if you keep demolishing houses, we will stop selling our equipment to you. How could the manufacturer of F-35 give it to somebody who's killing children? That's a disaster. Please convey our message to those people there in USA. Believe me, we love you. We love Joe Biden. But why? Do you know, a phone call from Joe Biden to that killer, Benjamin Netanyahu, would stop all this tragedy right now. Why doesn't he call him and say, stop killing children? Again, we're speaking to Dr. Can stop him. Mm -hmm. Again, we're speaking to Dr. Medhat Abbas. He is from the Gaza Health Ministry. Uh, for those who are watching, um, can you give us an idea of what's the situation for doctors like right now? I mean, I imagine... Uh, medical staff is probably working around the clock. We've, you know, we saw, we see there's 227 dead. So that's how many injuries are we talking about here? And you were describing very brutal injuries, things like amputations. Um, does Gaza even have the specialties, uh, the specializer, like the, the, the people who specialize in those specific things that it would need to even deal with these injuries? Because um, in some of the most sophisticated hospitals in the world, you might have trouble, I imagine, dealing with the kinds of amputations and uh, shrapnel injuries that people are, are getting who survive these bombings? Uh, we are understaffed. We are, the public staff, another meaning of the siege is taking only 50% and sometimes less every month for seven years today. Only 50% of your salary. And imagine that you're not affordable to buy many things because the full salary was not enough to meet our basic needs. So when it was dropped to 50% only because of this siege, imagine how could our situation be. So the public staff are frustrated because of that. On the other hand, we are understaffed because the government cannot recruit more staff to meet the needs of the patients because of the prevailing poverty in the community. And now because of Corona, many of us were infected by Corona and stayed home. They cannot get outside because they will be represent at risk for the patients. And now we are having those attacks it's not putting a pressure on the entire health system, but mainly the surgical departments in the, and the ICUs and the emergency rooms. Of course, they are suffering. You are making shifts, uh, emergency, of course, duty, and they don't leave the hospital for 24 hours and then change to another shift like that. But it's very exhausting, of course. And by the way, when you go back home, you want to sleep, you can't sleep, sorry. The drones will not let you sleep. The phones will not make you sleep. And the attacks every now and then will not make you sleep. So we have to work like drowsy. Believe me, if you stop asking me questions now, I'll sleep while making this interview. We are so tired. Mm. We haven't slept wow. for the last 10 days. Mm. We did not sleep. Well, Dr. Abbas, again, for those who are just joining, we were speaking with Dr. Medhat Abbas from the Health Ministry in Gaza. Dr. Abbas, we are really grateful to you for giving us uh, some of your time here today uh, and also last week. Thank you again for joining us here on Breakthrough News. Thank you so much, sir. And best mm -hmm. regards to all of you. May God bless you all. And I hope one day that that Joe Biden will pressurize Netanyahu to stop killing our children.